Hi there and welcome to Access Chat. I'm delighted that we've got Marcy Sutton with us today. Marcy is um, one of our more technical guests, but she's also done something which I really, really like, which is create a blog called Accessibility Wins. And so delighted to have you with us, Marcy. Uh, really interested to hear about your journey into accessibility and also the, the great stuff that you're doing with Accessibility Wins and what, what it was that prompted you to to, to start that in the first place. Good morning. Happy to be here. Yeah, well, we're, we're delighted to have you. We are really glad to have you on this morning, Marcy, so we're excited to talk to you today. Cool. Well, I don't really know what to say other than let's go. <laughs> uh, no, can, can, can you, um, um, no, in order to, to let our uh, audience to understand what you are, what you are doing, can you please tell us a little bit about you know where you are? You no, know, we, we know that you are based in Seattle, but also about you know what you what you are what you are currently doing, and what has been a little bit of your journey in, uh, so far. Sure, yeah. Right now I work at DQ Systems. I live in Seattle. Um, they are headquartered in Virginia, so we're a bit spread out, but I'm on the Axe Core team, and what that means is I contribute to a tool called Axe, which is currently an open source um, accessibility auditing solution. So for web developers, they would use Axe in their development workflow to try and anticipate accessibility problems. Um, so what that means is that I get to do really cool technical developer things and contribute to accessibility um, in a way that I think makes it really sustainable. Instead of going into a product directly and working on the accessibility, I'm working on tools that developers would use for auditing accessibility. Um, before that, I worked at Adobe for a short stint, um, and I'm feeling like DQ is a little bit of a better fit for me um, before that, I was at small companies like Substantial, which is a design and development company here in Seattle. Um, I did a few random projects there until I brought in a project for Google working on Angular. So I've actually contributed full-time to the Angular framework for... I, I worked full-time on it for about 10 months, and since then it's been sort of um, off and on open source contributions. And so... Definitely, I'm more on the technical side um, as a front-end developer, but I got into it working at an agency that had Target as a big client. And as you know, Target had legal action brought against them, and so everything that we built or designed for Target had to be accessible. So through that engagement, you know, I learned how cool accessibility was from a technical and design standpoint. I met a bunch of people that I thought were really cool, people with disabilities, um, including Steve Sawson, who is now my coworker, which is kind of funny, at DQ, working with some of the same people now. Um, and so, yeah, I just found that I really liked accessibility. There were some cool challenges, and I could make a career out of it. Excellent. And I think we've all come through slightly divergent paths to, to accessibility. I don't think there is a straight path in, mm -mm. into it. Uh, we all fall into this niche. So. Yeah, I, I was aware of your your work previously. Um, your your pizza presentation went a bit viral <laughs> within our own com within our company. Um, Did it? Yeah, oh man, so, that was so, so yeah. awkward. <laughs> <laughs> to fill well, people okay. in, what happened? Um, I did a talk at JSConf, which is a very hard conference to get your talk your talk selected. And I had a bit of a thing for tacos. Actually, the year before, I did a talk. Um, in the B track, which is open to anyone. And at the end of my talk, I had a, an accessible web component that delivered tacos. <laughs> and that was, that was great. That went really well. But then the next year, I decided to have a pizza delivered, and it didn't get there in time. So I'm on camera going, the pizza didn't show up. <laughs> <laughs> Officially took it a little too far, so I'm glad that you said <laughs> something good came out of that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, we were glad. We we still liked it. Um, so, one of the things that 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 I know that Deborah and Tanya and I are really passionate about is showing and and applauding people's good work. Um, we know that accessibility can be a bit of a lonely furrow to plow, 
Um, there's a, often you're, you're plugging away at this stuff on your own um, and don't always get rewarded or recognized. So the big, there's obviously the big contracts, the, the targets and, and the, you know, the, the large organizations where the, the, being the, the lawsuits, etc. But then there's all sorts of other small contributors. And, and I think that accessibility wins was really interesting for me because you were taking the time to highlight some of that. So, so how did it come about in the first place? I saw a gap and felt like, I mean, I've seen the, you know, accessibility people um, who I, I love dearly. Just sometimes we get upset about something. <laughs> you know, people aren't responding to us. They aren't making something accessible. And so I think we have a right to be frustrated sometimes. Um, but that just wasn't my style. Like, even if I do get frustrated with the pace of things, I don't hang on to that feeling for very long because I don't find it's productive. So just personally, I tend to try and spin things around and make them more positive anyway. So if I was going to put something down to paper, you know, commit it to a, a website, I wanted it to be something that would uplift and make people feel good because those bad feelings just don't help. They aren't productive. Um, and so I started asking around saying, hey, do you have any favorite websites? I got back a lot of mobile, native mobile apps and not quite as many websites. And I also got a lot of people who said that I should highlight fails <laughs> because that would be easy. There would be a lot of them. Uh, but it just wasn't my style. So, And I, I actually wanted it to try and improve a space. Like if native mobile was better, that's great, but that means mobile maybe has a, mobile web has a weakness or desktop web has a weakness. And so I wanted to make those spaces better. So did, you know, since my audience was mostly web developers, I focused on that and just tried to give people praise. And it turns out that was just the best thing because people get so excited when they find their thing has been written about. Um, and so that feedback that I got from people early on was like, okay, this is good. People are liking this. They're getting a little pat on the back. Um, and I feel a bit like... Uh, what's that? like Santa Claus or something. I'm kind of like sneaking around at night and finding something good and it's like, surprise, you won! And that's a really fun feeling. Yeah, that's great. So, Deborah, I know you've got a question for Marcy. Well, I, I do have a question, Marcy. I, I, a question and a comment. So, I agree with you. I really believe that... Um, instead of us beating up on each other all the time and, and I'm mad at you because you use the wrong word or I, there's just so much of that in our industry and I I sometimes feel probably due to my age that I have to go in and as the mother going alright everybody play nice because some of the comments that are made are vicious they're so they're, they're just so mean-spirited and and then when that happens we all shut down and we don't move forward we don't seek for understanding and so I I love your work because of that because I really think we're all learning we're all learning technology communications is changing so fast and so I write you know blogs too and, and there was one that I wrote recently that I was afraid to write I was afraid because I thought people are going to turn on me and so even as long as I've been in the industry you know and so I wrote it and I was really surprised at the positive response I got that at least now we could openly talk about these things and so I just am really glad you're out there and you're speaking your voice and you're doing these things because the only way we're really going to be able to reach web developers and designers is if we can help them really feel they could be successful at this and they could innovate and make a difference. And so I just really applaud. It's more of a comment. I really applaud the work that you're doing. I think it's very powerful. Thanks. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, part of my motivation was having been on the other side you know, having people bring me in, they were very encouraging. Like, no one wants to get told that their work sucks or that right. they suck or that they're doing a terrible job or what I know better than you, you know? Right. There's almost, like, a competition with it sometimes. Like, you come in as the, the consultant, you know, and you know better. So I think we really need to bring people along, you know, encourage them, like, hey, this is a safe place. We want you to come and be a part of this community. You know, the more the merrier, really. 
So I think that spirit is is captured pretty well in Accessibility Wins. I agree. I, I remember at an uh, IBM conference years ago, Greg Vanderheiden said, we have to stop eating our young in this industry. We have got to be more welcoming. We've got to encourage the younger people to come in. We've got to encourage all, as many people that want to come in and play and innovate and figure this out. And I still think we're doing a bad job at that. I um, Recently we got an email from somebody about Access Chat scolding us because our videos aren't captioned the second that we produce them. Now every single video is captioned and we work hard at that. But the voice was so negative and, and so scolding and and I remember giving a speech one time and I used the wrong, I spoke for hours and I thought that I did a good job and afterwards a woman came up and said you use this wrong word one time use people first language. Now I use people first language 2,000 times in my speech but I guess one time I forgot. So it's like that divides us and so we need more of Marcy. We need Marcy and more Marcy's and the Deborah's and the Neil's and then Antonio's. We need to welcome people to our industry. So thank you. Thank you. We need more empathy. It's like we point yes. this empathy out towards our user but we don't like include each other with this whole empathy thing. I think maybe we don't give ourselves enough empathy. <laughs> this right. is sort of an exploration I've been on is like, well, what is this magic, you know, caring thing? Like what does this mean? And I think it's really about having empathy. Yeah. Well no, said. Well said. I, I think that's very true. Um, I think that we we're a very technocratic profession. Um, there's a tendency to come in, as you say, and, and point at the broken stuff, and, and we do need to be uh, working with developers because actually the accessibility industry is tiny, the development community is huge, and yeah. we therefore we, we you know we've got to we've got to get people up to speed and 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 you know make ourselves redundant. Really, um, not that I don't think that we will because there's just too much work to do, but um, that's the aim. Uh, to cut myself out of a job by getting uh, stuff to the point where it's just part of everybody's normal way of working. Um, and that requires us not to be uh, combative and negative and you know, so to point out the good stuff, accentuate the positive. And, and, and that can be difficult sometimes, I know, because you know there, there are situations where people just don't want to know and, and, and that can be tricky. Um, but also, I think there's there's so much out there for you know, small content providers as well, because actually most of the people are um, that are creating content aren't companies, uh, don't have resources. So being mm -hmm. positive about those kind of people is really important, and 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 reaching out and 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 not scaring them off, because I think that accessibility can be perceived as being scary. Um, particularly on, on the, te the technical aspects. One of the reasons why we are studiously non-technical, apart from the fact that we're completely inept at it, is the... Um, I employ people that are better. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's what you want though, right? You want to surround yourself with people yeah. who are smarter than you. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. You, know, you play to your strengths. So my strengths are around sort of knowing stuff in, in you know around cognitive, etc., and 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 mm -hmm. doing the business case, bringing the connections together, stopping people from beating seven bells out of each other, and and moving things forward. Um, but we we didn't want to be you know a one one y chat because what we want to be is a very very big tent. So we wanted mm -hmm. to uh, bring people in. Uh, and, and encourage the discussion and gently sort of ex express these ideas and these, these different ways of working. And what we're finding is that um, there's a lot of stuff that falls outside of the general technical side of accessibility and there's lots of edge cases that we're seeing um, that are really interesting and, and, and we're seeing people really coming out of their shells as well, which I think is really exciting. So it's quite gratifying week on week where we see people say, what, before Access Chat, I wouldn't have talked about this in the open. So what, 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 we're, what, we're, what we're learning, and Access Chat is fantastic for this because I'm learning every week because we have great guests like yourself on, is, um, 
is to be humble and, and to not make, not make the assumptions because what I learn about my assumptions is that I'm pretty much always wrong. Um, there's always going to be a, a case that doesn't fit what I assumed it to be. Um, and, and I think that's that's the thing with things like WCAG. Where it works is great, but it's kind of intimidating. Um, it's certainly not great if you've got cognitive disabilities um, because most of the stuff that would benefit you is in AAA. Um, and also, actually just reading it if you've got a cognitive disability like me is a pain. It's a, yeah, well, it's a, I feel you on that one. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's that easy either. No. So it's, you know, it's, it's quite prickly. So um, I'm, and I'm working with Lisa Seaman and, and the Cognitive Accessibility Task Force anyway, but, and, and so is Deborah. But, it's, um, but it's, not, it's, not, it's not language that naturally appeals to a large audience. So I think the stuff that you're doing is really much more attractive. Um, so, so I'd like to know how you think we can do more of this more of the access chats, more of the accessibility wins, and, and, and what it is that, you know, who, who can, where, where do we go next with this, where, in, in the sort of positive side, you know, where do we bring our placards with smiley faces, where do we camp outside? Yeah, I think, well, we definitely need to find those, those gaps. And WCAG is a pretty big one. I've, there's been, I guess, for the last year or so, smiley faces. Yeah, we definitely need more smiley faces. Um, I feel like we need sort of, and and maybe this is done before, and I'm just I haven't seen it or something, but almost like a WCAG translation, <laughs> something in between. Because what I hear a lot of is, okay, I've looked at the basics. Where do I go for more intermediate or advanced accessibility stuff? And that's where people kind of hit a, a murky land. Because you you basically it's a it's like go look at WCAG. <laughs> And that is an important step if you're working in remediation. Um, I think for most web developers, that's pretty daunting. So I'm wondering if there's more of these in-between resources. Like Accessibility Wins is you know, not tied to anything really technical. It's just purely curated. Um, people submit stuff. It's like a feel-good thing. Um, I think that was a gap that I identified, that we didn't have much on the web that was showcasing something positive. I think any time we find a gap like that, you know, create a, some sort of a, either a, a website, blog, a podcast, you know, something that gives people content where, where that gap exists. And so I think something around WCAG, um, and I, and it could be like the company I'm working at now, DQ, I think they might have some more, you know, advanced resources for people. It's just about connecting, you know, the developers who need them with those resources. So that's one angle. Um, but yeah, we just have to keep smiling. Yeah, no, I, I thought it was interesting. I was sat doing a review with Lisa Seaman, who's, who's um, leading the Koga task force. And we were looking at the language. She was going, we need to make it more work -aggy. It's Like, oh, no. No. <laughs> No. We have a need for WCAG, obviously. Yeah, yeah um, we do. Absolutely, we do. I'm, I'm, we I'm, do. The hard part is that we're almost creating more work for ourselves because we need to translate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The language so, is impenetrable, and that's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I agree. I had a client of mine, a very large client, in the United States, and they, they said, how do we begin to do this? And so, of course, we pointed him to WCAG, and so they're like, okay, how do we begin to do this? So they actually spent months translating WCAG into their language. They um, companyized it, I, you know, and, and it was quite the process. And, and a lot of companies have done that. Yeah, and, and it seemed like not a good use of the time that they had, and a lot of money was spent doing it, and it, it just seemed, uh, and it was it was interesting in a way because this really large United States, it's a national, it's a U.S. based company, but it, they were like, okay, fine, we agree, Deborah, we will do disability inclusion, we'll look at it from employment, we'll do accessibility, okay, we we buy it. So now tell us how we do it step by step by step, and how do we find the experts? And we need training and blah blah blah. And I don't really think overall we have the right answers. 
You know, yeah. We go in and we say, well, we're going to sue you if you don't do this, which, by the way, people are getting sued even if they do do it. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of work to be done. But the one thing that you said earlier that I, I wanted to ask you a question on. So I believe um, that part of the solution is certainly building into the process and looking at the standards, all the things we're doing, but I do believe that there is a place for tools. I really, really do. And any other thing that we have solved or we're working on solving, privacy, security, things like that, there are always tools to help us. But I think a lot of times I feel such resistance to the tools, almost like if you use the tools, you're a cheater, cheater, basket eater. So I, I just see such resistance. And I was curious if you wanted to delve into that particular topic. Um, I Yeah, I think... Why wouldn't you want a tool that helps you find the low-hanging fruit? Um, I, I almost wonder if people feel like those tools are going to be replacing them, like they're not going to be as needed in their jobs, and I think that's a, you know, a realistic fear. Um, but what we want to do is stop wasting time on things that could be found by an automated tool. Like The tool isn't going to replace user testing. It's not going to replace good design. Um, it's just one small piece of the development process that frees you up to work on other tasks like usability testing or frankly just more development. So I think um, I really wanted to work on tools because I thought that it would be a good way for me to help other developers. Instead of putting all of my effort into one product, I could work on a tool that would then have way more reach and have, you know, be actually helping you know a developer using a browser extension or some sort of task runner um, in their development workflow, and so that to me was a really happy you know combination of things. But the the end goal is to to help people do a better job with accessibility. Um, I'm sort of feeling like this is a freight train that's sort of you know already left the station and we're going yep. on there. We'll have to bring people along. Um, so hopefully we can help you know, calm people's fears about, well, no, you're not being replaced because you do an important job. Um, tooling is just freeing up those tasks that, you know, you shouldn't have to go into a web, you know, rendered web page and find an, an incorrectly typed ARIA role. You know, right. for example. Like those little teeny things that you might not even see with your eyes on the first pass. Um, let, the, let the tool find that and, and let you, give you more time to go and fix it. Yeah. Well said. Well said. So I, I, I'm absolutely for um, reducing the, the, the cr crummy work um, and, and concentrating on the big stuff. Um, yeah. you know, build, build, building the alliances and, and looking at the, the bigger picture stuff. One of the things I'm really interested in is the, the, the kind of work that's happening right now inside some of the tech giants. Uh, like Facebook, like Google, where they're looking at applying their computing power to solving accessibility problems. So Facebook, full of images. Um, so they're looking at, at, at finding ways of, of using image recognition to describe images and stuff like that. That's um, so cool. Uh, it's it's exciting. It's not there yet, but what, what I what I I'm really excited about is we shouldn't knock the fact that um, auto captioning is not perfect. We should be applauding the fact that they are developing auto captions because there is no way on earth that we can caption all of the video content that is being created. We need that machine intelligence to be able to uh, make a more accessible future because yeah. I know how much effort it takes to, to manually caption stuff it's a lot. It's about six times as long as the actual video by the wow. time you've done the transcript and everything else. Especially if you're me. Um, then it's 12 times. Because I, I, I did our first ever access chat video with Gareth Ford Williams from the BBC. Gareth talks really fast, both dyslexic, both have a short term memory of a goldfish. And um, I spent six hours doing a half hour video. <laughs> it's not, you know, so it, it's well, yeah, but I mean, it, it, but it's one of those things where if I could get a computer to do that for me and do it accurately, why yeah. wouldn't I? Well, even if you could get them to do the first pass and then you could go edit, that would yeah. save you some time. Yeah, yeah. well, I think it's, it's just whether or not the corrections 
I think at, the, the, at this point in time, the corrections are almost as much effort as uh, mm. getting it right, but it will get there. Yeah. So we should be applauding that and, and, and looking at ways that we can deal with things like user-generated content. Um, you were asking for whether or not anybody had done some some stuff out there that made stuff easier. Now, in France, there's a company called Atalan, and they've they've created some guidelines called XA de Web, and what they've done is they've broken stuff up into roles. So they they, they have to comply with the, the idea is that everything complies to WCAG2, but they're looking at the different bits of the development process. So they've got guidelines for developers, they've got guidelines for graphic artists, they've got guidelines for the different parts of the, the product cycle. And I think that's really neat because then you know, you're not overwhelming people with stuff that they don't necessarily need to know for, for their job. They need to know that this is the bit. And I think that role-based accessibility learning is really important and it's something that I'd like to dive into a bit more another time. Um, Antonio, do you have any questions for Marcy? You're on mute. <laughs> We, we have asked to, to some of our guests in the, in the past who are working in product development and what type of relations they, they have with startups or if they are somehow engaged with the, with the startup community and what type of relationships, uh, no, as being experts on this field or they have done some work on this, what type of engagement they do with them in order to when they are creating a product, they start to design that from the beginning and they are not, oh, we will have that at later stage as a feature. Have you done, uh, from your contact with, with, with the developer community, what type of reception are you receiving from people working in startups in this space? In startups? Yes. <laughs> you see my, my face, I'm like making a face. Um, it's not usually that great. I think um, in the, I'm usually the person that's like, no, you should do it anyway, even if it successfully takes you longer, because I care about it. Startups, I've found, are usually trying to get you know their their minimum viable product out the door, trying to get something out fast and validated. Um, what I it was actually interesting working in that space because I felt like it gave me even more of a reason. Like if you are doing small iterations, you can get accessibility in quicker. <laughs> Instead of putting it off, that'll take much longer. Um, I didn't find that, that many people who felt that way. I think accessibility was just like not even considered. So I'd be much happier if I did hear of startups that, that were putting accessibility first, because I think in small chunks, it's a lot easier to manage. So I'd, I, I'm hoping you're seeing something better out there. <laughs> No, because I, 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 a few a few months ago, I have organized an hackathon in the, here in the airport in Cork, and that was exactly the same thing. They were creating uh, solutions to help the airport and to help people to navigate inside the airport, and they were not no, they were looking okay, how can we engage with users where we know where they are? What? But nobody was actually looking to find ways how we can new, help de use this technology to help people to navigate inside the airport. So they were looking for a way, but when they actually they could be able to do something more meaningful that could also support other groups of people, not just helping a shop to sell more. Because the technology was already there, so the steps would basically be quite small in order to help create something that could help the users to navigate inside the airport in a more efficient way. Hmm. So, so, oh, I hear dogs. <laughs> that's, that's okay. Um, so maybe um, some of it comes down to Agile, and Agile is really important, and, and obviously there's a, a move to DevOps right now, but perhaps um, we need more people being able to demonstrate the the possibility of using and and making sure that you include accessibility in the uh, in the agile development process because it is entirely possible you can uh, you can have the accessibility in there you can include it in your sprints uh, we, we need to be accepting that not everything you know as with all of the feature sets in an agile development process is going to be there 
in your first iteration. But so long as you have a backlog and accessibility doesn't stay permanently in the backlog, I think it's entirely doable and you can fit it in as part of that process. Yeah, I agree. It's too hard. Small wins, yeah, and really just making a culture around, you know, getting it in early instead of, like, way after the fact. Because we all know that doesn't work. It doesn't work with mobile either. No. Or any so, of those, you know, important building blocks. Yeah, yeah, that, that, oh, it's in phase two. Yeah, heard, heard that one before. <laughs> just a few times. Yeah, so, so that's, that's why tools are important, because they can help, you know, people who are absolutely not specialists um, you know we've you know pe but people who are specialists can use tools too and so what that would do is for you know a startup they could get a browser extension or some sort of a remote tool and they can actually use it to help them figure out what's going on um, so I think that that's part of the appeal of working on tools is that we can extend accessibility to you know, to startups or to companies that traditionally haven't taken the time to add accessibility before. Yeah, we, we, what we don't want to be doing is adding massive costs and, and, and loading up overheads onto small companies that are starting out um, unnecessarily because it doesn't have to be high cost if you're, you're including it at the beginning. I'm yeah. aware that we've we've reached our half hour point. Yeah, so but I, I think we, we need, we, we, there's, there's something that we are missing here, so uh, I think, uh, Mars is, is is also working in, in, in a project called GDI Seattle, helping women to learn how to ship products and how to, how to cook. So can you can you just talk to what type, we are talking about young girls, we are talking about people that are changing their careers. Can you give us a little bit of an idea about what type of people you have on, uh, working or helping in that space? Yeah, Girl Develop It is a nonprofit that helps adult women, so not kids. Um, sometimes we have moms that come in, um, and we're like a mom and a daughter will come in, but it, the goal is to teach adult women, um, people who are transitioning careers, or you know maybe they're a project manager and they just want to be more effective in their job. So I teach a lot of the front end classes like HTML and CSS, which is great for accessibility because I'm getting you know, a bug in their ear really early, you know, maybe even the first time they're hearing about HTML. And so it's been a really good way to give back to the community. It, it is a lot of work, <laughs> as I'm sure anyone who teaches and writes curriculums will know that it is a lot of work. But it's super worth it when I have women who, you know, say that this is what they needed to get started or they felt encouraged, and, and those are really good feelings. Marcy, I know that we're um, almost out of time, but I, I just really want to ask one more question before we go. Um, okay. it, 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 to me, it sort of lends itself with the work that you are doing with women and girls, and I'm very big on trying to do a lot of work there, too. Um, very important topic to me. But as speaking to you as a technologist, a very you know well-known technologist in our space, um, what do we need to do? What do we need to do to bring more people into the conversations, more web developers, more content people? I, I just think that we're going to fail if we don't have those voices in this conversation. So yeah. I was just curious, what do you think, what can we do here at Access Chat to support you? What can we do to support the entire accessibility field? But that's a really important thing we've got to solve. Yeah, I think the the pipeline, as we call it, at least in you know for women in technology, I think that that is getting getting better. I think what we need to focus on as an industry is keeping people, <laughs> you yes. know, not not losing people when you know the going gets rough, or or even just trying to not let the going get rough. Um, so part of you know, and I I've seen a lot of things written by you know really amazing people lately, and it seems like you know we've been working really hard at this pipeline problem. We need to work harder at you know making it a safe, positive place to pe for people to work in web development. I agree. I agree. Well said. Yeah, I'm 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 hopeful that I'm part of the pipeline. Not me personally, but I've I've got a, a bunch of apprentices. So we have a, an accessibility apprentice program that I started uh, at Atos, where we we teach people the coding skills, but also the auditing skills and how to use assistive tech. And I'd love for more companies to, 
to do stuff like that. Um, but, but also for people to see that it's a, a viable career because yeah. that's what they have. You know, they've, they've got a viable career within our organization. We're a large company, we've got 100,000 employees. There's plenty of projects for them to be uh, working on over the next 15, 20 years. So here in Cork, there's a, a well-known project that started here called Code Dojo. Uh, that is being being adopted but in, a, in a very simple format by people uh, all, all all around the world, and then you see when you when you build that culture in the in your community, it will it will develop to other uh, to other groups when they're doing sometimes the same type of project under under a different name. So this weekend we had EMC doing a very interesting work with kids and robotics, where all EMC vo uh, employees were volunteers and helping kids to work with robotics. So sometimes you, know, you just put the seed and then things can uh, work very well around the space where you are. <laughs> That's so cool. So yes, more inclusion just all across the board I think is the answer. <laughs> okay, uh, I've got to wind us up. We've, we've overshot slightly, who cares. Um, so Marcy, <laughs> thank you very much. It's been great you could join us. Look forward to chatting with you on Twitter tomorrow night. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you, Marcy. See you later.